We come to God's Word, uh, and today we finish our series in James. We've been moving through uh, the remarkable letter of James. Uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, leader of the Jerusalem church and leader of the early church. Uh, He wrote this letter, probably we think, to Christians, suffering Christians, persecuted Christians, scattered uh, throughout the Roman Empire, probably after one of the early uh, persecutions of the Christians in, uh, in Judea. And uh, he writes as a pastor to, to those that he can't care for personally or immediately and encourages them to live the Christian life in the real way. That's, I guess, what we've been uh, figuring out as we go through James's message is uh, not just to say the words of faith, but to live a life of devotion to God because of all that he's uh, done for us in Jesus. So we come to the very final section, the final paragraphs of James's letter today. And um, it's a wonderful challenge as well, an encouragement to us to pray in particular. That is our, our theme today, how the gospel changes us into a person whose prayers are powerful. A person whose prayers are powerful. So we're reading from James 5 and we begin at verse 13 and we go through to the end of the letter. James chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, James writes to the Christians and says... Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, If one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Let's pray before we think about God's word. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would make your word clear to us the spirit that you have sent into the world has written the word it is inspired it is breathed out exhaled by the spirit of god and it helps us to understand you lord jesus the written word helps us to understand you the living word the living message from God. Let us receive your message to us today in the words of your servant James that we might be a people whose prayers are powerful in this world. Amen. Well, Christians are people who pray. Luke chapter 5 verse 16 says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Think about that. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Often. To speak to God. Jesus prayed intensely on the night that he was arrested. That his heavenly father might spare him from his suffering, the the cup of wrath and death but Jesus also said he accepted God's will if that is what had to be and so the early Christians were always praying to God like their master pouring out their hearts to God constantly 
I wonder where you sit in your relationship to prayer. It might seem like nonsense to you. People are just talking to the empty sky or their own imagination. It's not real. Perhaps you've had so many prayers go unanswered, you have very little motivation now to pray. Or perhaps you've recently prayed about something and it happened in an amazing way. So you are currently, you're just a prayer fanatic. It it works. I will pray. I wonder where you sit in your relationship to prayer. The letter of James has been all about living out faith in Christ in a real practical way, not just talking but doing. So it's really interesting that he finishes the letter by encouraging the Christians to do the thing you might think is the least practical thing, a merely spiritual thing, to pray. I think he believes that praying to God is the most practical thing a Christian can do and the surest sign of a real and genuine, practical, living, fair income faith. And if he's right about that, and he is right, it's very exciting for us. Your prayers can be God's instrument to radically, miraculously, eternally change yourself and other people. You've got this powerful tool. I wonder if you use it. So, what does James say about using it? That's what we'll learn today, I think. I haven't found it easy to answer the puzzles that James gives us in these last verses. I know some of our Bible study groups during the week have puzzled over these things too. Some of them are thinking uh, about James at this time. So, for example, is James promising people will always be healed if we pray? Hard to imagine that that's what he's promising, but it kind of sounds like it. What's the relationship between our sin and our sickness? Do we get sick because we do bad things? When he talks about a righteous person, does he mean all Christians? Because you know, we're all made righteous because of Jesus in God's eyes. Or is he using the word to talk about an especially holy Christian and their prayers are going to be powerful? Why do the elders use oil? In an anointing uh, in verse 15. There's a lot of puzzles. But I don't think it's too hard to put a profile together of a person whose prayers are going to be powerful, according to James. They will be praying all the time. They'll be praying about everything. They'll be praying for healing. They'll be forgiving other Christians. They'll be being forgiven. They'll be praying earnestly. They'll know God's desires and they'll pray about those. They'll care most of all about people's relationship with God. A person like that is going to be powerfully praying. And I pick these insights, at least those, up, even though we might not solve all the puzzles, as James gives his instructions and his examples about a whole bunch of things to do with prayer. As we've gone through the letter, you might have noticed James doesn't really develop long arguments or have you know, a concept running through a, a whole chapter. He doesn't write like the Apostle Paul, if you read Paul's letters in the Bible. Paul develops these long arguments over many chapters. James just kind of blasts you with a truth, then he just reloads, boom, and then he hits you with another one, and then boom another and another and another sayings and aphorisms and um, a, a powerful visual illustration and then on to the next thing and you're not quite sure how it's all being tied together but I have still even though there's not really one theme in this sermon uh, started each point of my sermon with the same letter because that's I just can't help myself that's what I like to do so we're going to talk about Prayer when we suffer, when we sing, when we're sick, and when we stray. Prayer when we suffer, when we sing, when we're sick, and when we stray. 
important in all of those cases. Verse 13 says, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. The word for trouble here is the same word he used just a few a sentence before in verse 10 that was translated suffering. Is any of you suffering? And it means all kinds of suffering. Mostly it means quite serious suffering, persecution, injustice, grief, loss, heartache, regret. Are you suffering? Pray. We could respond to our suffering in a variety of ways. We could respond to our suffering with cursing, with anger, with revenge, with self-pity, despair, giving up. But we should instead respond by praying. James doesn't even say, let that person pray for deliverance. He just says, let them pray. Pray for strength to endure it, maybe. Pray for patience. Pray to know the reason for my suffering, maybe. Pray to be rescued from it, sometimes, yes. But just pray. Speak to your Father in heaven about your pain. He cares. His Son, our King, suffered the unimaginable in body and soul. Speak to Him. What are you holding it in for? But are you happy? You might be. Then you should still pray. In fact, sing your prayers is basically what James is saying. Your prayers of joyful praise. I mean, again, we've got options here. You could just respond to a good time, a time of joy in your life by congratulating yourself. That might be your first reaction on your success, on your wisdom. But instead, you should respond by prayer thanking God there is one thread I think I've detected in James's letter just for myself at least the way I've thought about it I think a lot of the letter is about how we react how we react to situations as they immediately come upon us When a respectable person comes in the room, at the same time as a less respectable person, how will you react to them? That's one of the scenarios James puts. When someone asks you for help, how are you going to react? When somebody hurts your feelings, how will you react? And right at the end of the letter, James is saying, I think, that our primal reaction to anything, immediately, and everything, all the time, should be to pray. I bring it to God. Right then. Suffering, pray first. Good times, pray first whether in suffering or in song, pray. And if you are sick, pray. And ask others to pray for you too. He says, Is anyone among you sick? Then let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. 
And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Well, what do we learn here from these very interesting verses? I think we learn that God is ultimately in control, even over the physical universe. He's ultimately in control even over your body. So if you are sick and you want to be well, your first reaction should be to pray to the God who is in control. No matter what medicine you get, if it is not his will, healing will not happen. The Bible commentators aren't sure about the oil that the uh, elders use when they go to pray for somebody. Um, but it was probably used as a medicine. We're not sure. Sometimes it could be um, a, a symbol of, of faith, but it was probably used as a medicine. That's how oil is used by the Good Samaritan in the story that Jesus told. Luke chapter 10, verse 34, he anointed uh, the wounds of, of the wounded man with wine and oil. So it's medicinal. So James is probably saying, use medicine and pray. If you're sick, use both. But remember, it's really the prayer that makes the sick person well. Because it's God who uses anything, medicine included, to achieve his purpose. At the end of the day, it's not the medicine that truly raises the person up, he says. It's the Lord who raises them up. So give thanks where it's due, to God. Will prayer always cure the sick? No. The Apostle Paul once had to lend he, leave his friend uh, Trophimus in a town called Miletus uh, because he was too sick to continue. He said, we, we left Trophimus back there. He couldn't continue in the journey. We left him sick there. There's not a doubt in my mind that Paul prayed about that. But Trophimus was still sick. And Paul travelled around with a doctor. Don't know if you know that. His name was Luke. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts in the New Testament. Who helped Paul, no doubt, with his many injuries and illnesses. Because Paul had a habit of getting shipwrecked and beaten up every other day. And, and Luke cared for him. He was his physician and his companion. If God was just a genie in a bottle and prayer automatically gave you your wish, you'd never have needed Dr. Luke. And of course, nobody is permanently healed in this life. We all die. So prayer is not a magic trick to cure all sickness. It is his will to give or to withhold. We submit to it. When we are sick, is it always because we've committed a particular sin? No, Jesus said that's not the case. He was asked about that quite specifically in the case of a particular man or a couple of people. He said no. No, it's not because he sinned. But the Bible also says there can be sometimes a link between our sin and our health. Uh, Paul said some of the Corinthian Christians were sick because they'd been, I mean, really sinning like a bunch of maniacs. He said, this is why some of you are sick. So James is saying, let a time of prayer also be a time of confession. This isn't talking about uh, going to a priest for confessional. It's talking about Christians who know that they've treated each other poorly admitting to each other that that's the case and becoming friends again. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. When you are vulnerable in sickness, when you're physically weakened, you will often remember how much you need the Lord. And you may be in a better position to admit your mistakes. Perhaps that's why sometimes when we're sick, we're more aware of 
our need for forgiveness. As you pray about that and as you share that with the pastors or the elders, and they pray about that and with each other and we pray about that together, God restores things, James is saying. He restores people to help. He restores relationships. Actually, I said earlier that James doesn't have any one theme running through all these prayer comments. But I wonder if we've just stumbled on it. It works for me anyway. Maybe we can say that prayer has the power to restore. Prayer has the power to restore. And that's what we go to God asking for when we pray. That what prayer is really asking for is a restoration. Restoring our hearts to joy and to song after we've suffered. Restoring our bodies to health after we've been sick. Restoring our relationships to friendship after we've sinned against each other. Is that what your heart prays for? Is that, what, is that what's on your heart when you pray? A restoration. That God would be restoring the world, restoring our lives to what they ought to be if, if sin was being overcome in this world. I think that's why James uses Elijah as his example as we keep moving through the passage because he doesn't pick an example of Elijah praying for somebody who was sick even though he's talking about sickness then he talks about Elijah and Elijah the prophet in the Old Testament he did heal people who were sick and he and uh, Elijah and Elisha prayed for people and they were healed and there are many examples like that in the Old Testament many examples from Jesus' life that James could have used. But he picks an unusual example of prayer. He doesn't pick Elijah praying for someone who is sick. Um, I mean, it's obviously an inspiration for us that Elijah prayed. He had great faith. Um, but why this particular example from the life of Elijah? I'll remind you, it was in verse 17. He said, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. You might not remember the story. Uh, but Israel was far away from the Lord because they were worshipping idols. Elijah knew that God had promised to Moses hundreds of years before that one of the things God might do if Israel sinned was stop the rain. He'd said that. So Elijah asks God to do what he promised to do. And then Elijah challenged the priests of Baal, the idols, to a showdown on Mount Carmel and God sent fire from heaven to burn up the altar and it proved that Yahweh was the true and living God. And all the people, all the Israelites were so shocked they repented of their sins and then the rain came. So... It wasn't just that God restored the creation with rain. What was really going on, and therefore what Elijah was really praying for when he prayed about the rain, was for the faith of Israel to be restored. That's what he cared about. That's what he was praying for, that the faith of Israel would be restored. And it was. They repented and they were spiritually restored. Prayer was used to restore faith. A person whose prayers are powerful will be a person who is using prayer, speaking to God, pleading with God about exactly that. About that above all else, the restoration of people's faith in God. Maybe that happens when they're sick. Sometimes. Sometimes. Maybe it happens when their relationships are in trouble and, and they wake up to their need for God. But whatever else is going on, that's God's desire to restore people to himself. And his promise is this 
is if they repent and turn to him, he will restore them. So that's what we want most of all as well. So that's what we pray about. Every Christian must know that we are engaged in a mighty spiritual war for the souls of men and women. That's what's going on. We're led by the Prince of Light into the battle against the darkness of unbelief. We are at war. Don't forget where you are. Don't forget what time it is. You are in a war and it is time to fight. And this does transform the way that we think about prayer. John Piper used a homely illustration. He said, now listen, prayer is not a domestic intercom used for calling in more pleasures to be delivered to the den. He's an American, okay? The, 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 the rumpus room or whatever. Prayer is not a domestic intercom used for calling in more pleasures to be delivered to the den. You know, can we get some more jumbo-sized Pepsis and popcorns down into the home theatre room, please? Thank you, Lord. Amen. Bzz. No, says Piper. Prayer is a wartime walkie-talkie to be used for calling in supplies to the front line. The bombs are falling and we need power and faith and humility. We need chances to speak to Jesus. We need opportunities to do good works. And we need the faith to react to everything in our life in a godly way. We need the supply of God to fight against selfishness and sin and our pride in our lives and to fight for generosity and the gospel to go into the world. Call upon God to give you everything you need to fight. If you think sickness might be getting in the way of the fight, then pray against it. If you think a broken relationship might be getting in the way of the fight, then Pray for its healing. But pray for the restoration of faith. And this is exactly where James finishes the letter. So I think that's, why he's, that's what he's talking about. Saying that prayer is for when people stray from the truth to restore them to faith, like Elijah did for Israel. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. In the context of this whole section on prayer, it's implied that prayer itself is the main way of bringing people back. When somebody strays into a life of saying they have faith but they just don't show it in the way that James has been teaching us to show it, you need to pray for that person. That is the most sacred work of prayer. Will we care about that person's restoration? You know, my grandmother prayed for 20 years for one of her sons to stop wandering from the truth about Jesus. That's a lot of daily prayers that God seemed to say no to. For a long time. Now that son did stop wandering. 20 years of prayers for him. Uh, I saw him yesterday. <laughs> it was good to see him. And he came back to God. She cared enough about the restoration to pray. Others she prayed for have not yet stopped wandering. And she's dead now. So if those prayers are answered, she won't see that answer on this earth. Only in heaven, I guess. But will I care enough about restoration to keep praying those prayers for those I knew she was praying for? Will the prayer for repentance and restoration for mine 
and for others be my first reaction to suffering, to blessing, to sickness, and to souls that stray from God. Followers of Jesus, I ask you, what will be your first reaction? Pray. If we show our faith by what we do, we will pray this way about everything, all the time. And we will see the power of prayer. Let's pray. Let's pray now. Great God who answers prayer, we do not understand the mystery of your will. Why do you do some things and not others? Why when we pray, Does it seem to us that the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no or sometimes no answer at all? We submit to you, our Father. You know what is best for us, for this world. You are restoring all things in the way that you know best. But we beg to be allowed to partner with you And we partner most powerfully, profoundly with our prayer, with this thing that seems so useless, so merely spiritual. But you are the living God, and this is your world. And when we petition you, things change. Give us faith to pray when we are suffering. Oh, when we are so happy, we, we live with song. And when we are sick, and when people stray from your life and your good news, let our first reaction be to be a people who pray. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.